This is a chapter from my novel, Trout Fishing in America. The chapter is called The Hunchback Trout. The creek was made narrow by little green trees that grew too close together. The creek was like 12,845 telephone booths in a row with high Victorian ceilings and all the doors taken off and all the backs of the booths knocked out. Sometimes when I went fishing in there, I felt just like a telephone repairman, even though I did not look like one. I was only a kid covered with fishing tackle, but in some strange way by going in there and catching a few trout, I kept the telephones in service. I was an asset to society. It was pleasant work, but at times it may be uneasy. It could grow dark in there instantly when there were some clouds in the sky and they worked their way onto the sun. Then you almost needed candles to fish by and foxfire in your reflexes. Once I was in there when it started raining. It was dark and hot and steamy. I was, of course, on overtime. I had that going in my favor. I caught seven trout in 15 minutes. The trout in those telephone booths were good fellows. There were a lot of young cutthroat trout six to nine inches long, perfect pen size for local calls. Sometimes there were a few fellows, 11 inches or so, for the long distance calls. I've always liked cutthroat trout. They put up a good fight, running against the bottom and then broad jumping. Under their throats they fly the orange banner of Jack the Ripper. Also in the creek were a few stubborn rainbow trout, seldom heard from, but they're all the same, like certified public accountants. I catch one every once in a while. They were fat and chunky, almost as wide as they were long. I've heard those trout called squire trout. It used to take me about an hour to hitchhike to that creek. There was a river nearby. The river wasn't much. The creek was where I punched in. Leaving my cart above the clock, I'd punch out again when it was time to go home. I remember the afternoon I caught the hunchback trout. A farmer gave me a ride in a truck. He picked me up at a traffic signal beside a bean field, and he never said a word to me. His stopping and picking me up and driving me down the road was as automatic a thing to him as closing the barn door. Nothing need be said about it, but still I was in motion traveling 35 miles an hour down the road, watching houses and groves of trees go by, watching chickens and mailboxes enter and pass through my vision. Then I did not see any houses for a while. This is where I get out, I said. The farmer nodded. The truck stopped. Thanks a lot, I said. The farmer did not ruin his audition for the Metropolitan Opera by making a sound. He just nodded his head again. The truck started up. He was the original silent old farmer. A little while later, I was punching in at the creek. I put my card above the clock and went into that long tunnel of telephone booths. I waited about 73 telephone booths in. I caught two trout in a little hole that was like a wagon wheel. It was one of my favorite holes and always good for a trout or two. I always like to think of that hole as a kind of pencil sharpener. I put my reflexes in and they came back out with a good point on them. Over a period of a couple of years, I must have caught 50 trout in that hole, though it was only as big as a wagon wheel. I was fishing with salmon eggs and using a size 14 single egg hook on a pound and a quarter test tippet. The two trout lay in my creel covered entirely by green ferns, ferns made gentle and fragile by the damp walls of telephone booths. The next good place was 45 telephone booths in. The place was at the end of a run of gravel, brown and slippery with algae. The run of gravel dropped off and disappeared at a little shelf where there were some white rocks. One of the rocks was kind of strange. It was a flat white rock. Off by itself from the other rocks, it reminded me of a cat I had seen in my childhood. The cat had fallen or been thrown off a high wooden sidewalk that went along the side of a hill in Tacoma, Washington. The cat was lying in a parking lot below. The fall had not appreciably helped the thickness of the cat, and then a few people had parked their cars on the cat. Of course, that was a long time ago, and the cars looked different from the way they look now. You hardly see those cars anymore. 
They are the old cars. They have to get off the highway because they can't keep up. That flat white rock off by itself from the other rocks reminded me of that dead cat come to lie there in the creek among 12,845 telephone booths. I threw out a salmon egg and let it drift down over that rock and wham, a good hit, and I had the fish on, and it ran hard downstream, cutting at an angle and staying deep, and really coming on hard, solid and uncompromising, and then the fish jumped, and for a second I thought it was a frog. I had never seen a fish like that before. God damn, what the hell? The fish ran deep again, and I could feel its life energy screaming back up the line to my hand. The line felt like sound. It was like an ambulance siren coming straight at me, red light flashing, and then going away again, and then taking to the air and becoming an air raid siren. The fish jumped a few more times, and it still looked like a frog, but it didn't have any legs. Then the fish grew tired and sloppy, and I swung and splashed it up the surface of the creek and into my net. The fish was a 12-inch rainbow trout with a huge hump on its back a hunchback trout, the first I'd ever seen. The hump was probably due to an injury that occurred when the trout was young. Maybe a horse stepped on it, or a tree fell over in a storm, or its mother spawned where they were building a bridge. There was a fine thing about that trout. I only wish I could have made a death mask of him. Not of his body, though, but of his energy. I don't know if anyone would have understood his body. I put it in my creel. Later in the afternoon, when the telephone booths began to grow dark at the edges, I punched out of the creek and went home. I had that hunchback trout for dinner, wrapped in cornmeal and fried in butter. Its hump tasted sweet as the kisses of Esmeralda. This is a chapter from my novel, In Watermelon Sugar. The chapter is called, The Watermelon Sun. I woke up before Pauline and put on my overalls. A crack of gray sun shone through the window and lay quietly on the floor. I went over and put my foot in it, and then my foot was gray. I looked out the window and across the fields and piney woods and the town to the forgotten works. Everything was touched with gray cattle grazing in the fields, and the roofs of the shacks, and the big piles in the forgotten works, all looked like dust. The very air itself was gray. We have an interesting thing with the sun here. It shines a different color every day. No one knows why this is, not even Charlie. We grow the watermelons in different colors the best we can. This is how we do it. Seeds gathered from a gray watermelon, picked on a gray day, and then planted on a gray day, will make more gray watermelons. It is really very simple. The colors of the days and the watermelons go like this. Monday, red watermelons. Tuesday, golden watermelons. Wednesday, gray watermelons. Thursday, black soundless watermelons. Friday, white watermelons. Saturday, blue watermelons. Sunday, brown watermelons. Today would be a day of gray watermelons. I like best tomorrow, the black, soundless watermelon days. When you cut them, they make no noise and taste very sweet. They are very good for making things that have no sound. I remember there was a man who used to make clocks from the black, soundless watermelons, and his clocks were silent. The man made six or seven of these clocks, and then he died. There is one of the clocks hanging over his grave. It is hanging from the branches of an apple tree and sways in the winds that go up and down the river. It, of course, does not keep time anymore. Pauline woke up while I was putting my shoes on. Hello, she said, rubbing her eyes. You're up. I wonder what time it is. It's about six. I have to cook breakfast this morning at Idef, she said. Come over here and give me a kiss, and then tell me what you would like for breakfast. <laughs> 